Here's Howie now. He, of course, is the voice of the New York Mets, and I would have loved to have heard put it in the books late on, on Friday night with Mr. DeGrom. Howie, of course, uh, says hello. Mr. Rose, nice to chat, pal. How you doing today, okay? Always great to chat, my friend. How are you, Chris? I'm doing well, Howie. And remember, folks, Howie is a wonderful meta historian. You know, he basically was at the first game in 62. I no, say he that, wasn't. Howie, I want to get No, he wasn't. You weren't at the first? Okay. I think you 60, were. I, I, I was eight years old. I was eight years old, but I wasn't there. It was too cold. It was, it was chilly and rainy at the cold at the that day. I don't do rain and cold. <laughs> yes, you do. All right, let's talk about the Grom though. As far as Seaver is concerned, is this the best? Did, did has the Grom matched Seaver as far as best stretch of pitching, or is there a time there in Seaver's career, and of course in '69, where for a year or so he was actually even better than the Grom? Give me a little comparison to Grom Seaver right now, as far as the height of their powers. Let me hear. Yeah, I'm glad you said height of their powers because what you have to understand is that Tom Seaver pitched 20 years in the big leagues. Most of them were outstanding, and probably at least half of them were close to, if not actually, Cy Young caliber seasons. This is Jacob deGrom's fourth consecutive, and we're only a month into this one, Cy Young caliber year. But at their peaks, I'm glad you mentioned 69 because I think that's the easy comparison when people look towards Seaver and which year was his best. Seaver's best year was 1971. And I think uh, if you were to go back on uh, baseball reference or something and just look at uh, Seaver's game logs from the all-star break on, he was almost unhittable. And, you know, he didn't pile up strikeouts at the rate Jacob deGrom does now. But what the Grom is doing is simply otherworldly. So, sure, it's a fair comparison with Seaver's best, but let's spread it out over a little bit longer period. 100% I agree. Tom uh, was superb there for about nine to 10 years with the Mets uh, from 67 to 77. The Grom not quite there yet. Now, he has been phenomenal. And one thing about this staff, Howie, uh, listen, I understand Synagogue off of Tommy John, who knows, but Carrasco will return eventually. And if DeGrom stays fresh and they make the playoffs, with DeGrom going twice in a short series or even three times in a longer series, they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to have a puncher's chance. He is that good. And with him going at full tilt with the rest of that rotation behind him, which is not bad, it's going to be pretty good. The Mets are going to be dangerous if they are so fortunate throughout the summer and in a postseason environment with that starting staff. Let me hear your thoughts. They, Go ahead. They, they can be. You know, I think that's the best case scenario. Now, you're looking at Taiwan Walker, who was very good yesterday, pitched seven shutout innings. We've seen him be erratic, as he was in his last start. But when you factor in, as you mentioned, the returns of Syndergaard and Carrasco, and remember, Noah's coming off Tommy John. You don't know what to expect. Carrasco's not pitched a lot over the last few years because of his health. So, you know, you, you do have to issue that disclaimer. But when they do come back, you know, that really lengthens the rotation. And don't forget, Seth Lugo is going to be back to really help out the back end of that bullpen, too. And that is every bit as significant to me as getting those other two starters back. So they have a chance to be very, very good. I just wouldn't set the playoff rotation quite yet. Yeah, that's, good, that's why we love Howie. All right, the Mets here, when you think about the Grom's greatness – and they've had an easy schedule. You know, the Nationals, no Soto. The Cubs are nothing to write home about. The Rockies, you know, and everything else. They, and the Phillies are under 500. They haven't really sort of broken off with Atlanta struggling as much as you'd like. Little disappointing there. And I know the weather has been a factor, Howie. But that's why, yes, it was important to win that series. But the Mets have not been as good record-wise as you think they could have been after these first 15, 18 games. Let me get your take on that. Go ahead. One of the reasons for that, and you're right, was highlighted yesterday because they played as close to a perfect baseball game as you can. And I'm not saying you've got to be perfect every time out, but this team, not only early this season, but too often over the last few years, has beaten itself because they were not strong defensively. And there have been several players playing out of position this year, and that's just the way the club is structured right now, and it's going to cost them a little bit. What they saw yesterday from, Al, uh, from Albert Almora Jr. in center field uh, was a revelation when you consider that, A, that's his natural position, and he's one of the best pure defensive center fielders in baseball. I don't know how often they can work him in, but it's nice to have that guy around for sure. Um, they executed yesterday on a, 
a cutoff play that uh, you know resulted in nailing Victor Robles trying to stretch two into three. Some of those tight plays haven't worked out that well, and um, you know they've just kicked the ball around a little bit too much. If they don't beat themselves and they straighten things out defensively, they've got a chance to be a really, really good team. And maybe the NL East is not as good as we thought. You know, the Phillies have been struggling. Atlanta can't hit right now, 9-12. and 12. You know, the Nationals don't look like with injuries and everything else. You wonder about them. You know, the Marlins are the Marlins. So maybe we thought top to bottom, the best division in the, in, uh, the National League. Maybe that's not going to be the case with the way the Giants have played in the NL West, Howie. This division may not be as dominant as we thought there a couple of weeks ago. What's your take on that? Let me hear I'm just not ready to go there on April 26th. I, I, I guess I've just been around long enough to the point where I consider the start to a season anything up to Memorial Day. You know, it's basically by the end of May when a season really starts to take shape and you can begin to separate the teams that might be for real with others that maybe got off to a fast start and now we're seeing a market correction. The weather's a big factor. You mentioned that. And I think once you get towards Memorial Day, generally all throughout the country, the weather has warmed up. Guys are in optimum situations to perform. They're playing more regularly. You know, the Mets still haven't had a stretch of playing more than five or six days in a row because of the COVID outbreak the Nationals had and a couple of postponements and a suspension. So, you know, they need to get 10 days or so of consecutive days playing baseball under their belt. And that's why I think you really need a couple of months to let everything shake out before you get the real tech and feel of what this season could look like. Always a pleasure to talk to Howie. Great to have you back with the microphone. Everything else, keep up the good work. We'll check in. Appreciate you coming on here today. Thanks, buddy. Anytime.